We're the country that went to the moon. Why can't we do this? How many times have you heard that metaphor from someone running for office? I love a good moonshot. As a NASA nerd, as a human spaceflight nerd, I love that metaphor. As a lobbyist, I hate that metaphor because it hides the reality. It hides the reality that federal spending doesn't look today like it looked in the 1960s. When President Kennedy challenged us to send a man to the moon by the end of the decade, he had more of the federal budget available to him to do it. What do I mean? I used to work for a member of the U.S. House who happened to be on the Ways and Means Committee. And I loved this one thing he did for a couple of years where he would go around giving this presentation to people around the district. It was a presentation we called the Pac-Man Report or the Pac-Man Presentation. And what it did was highlight the difference in a couple of different types of federal spending. It highlighted discretionary spending versus mandatory spending. And those are two really important concepts for advocates to differentiate. Discretionary spending is the type of spending you see fought about on 24-hour news networks or dealt with in these government shutdowns that are talked about so frequently anymore. Mandatory spending is stuff that Congress can't touch every year. It's built in differently. Mandatory spending is dominated by a few things. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid block grants to the states, and interest on the national debt. Discretionary spending is almost everything else that the federal government does. And I loved that my former boss gave this presentation all the time because it debunked that metaphor. Why don't we have moonshots anymore? Because there's less and less of the pie available to do that. How drastic is that? It's pretty bad. Back when Kennedy was president, two-thirds of the federal budget was discretionary spending, stuff that Congress could vote on and prioritize. Mandatory spending was only a third of the federal budget back then. But now, in the 2010s and beyond, it's flipped. More than two-thirds of the federal budget now is consumed by mandatory spending. And there's less and less of the total pie available for Congress to allocate and appropriate for other things. This can be really distressing to citizen advocates, and it's one of the first things I talk about when I train advocates. Because we need to understand the big picture items that really drive the federal agenda. This isn't the sexy part of campaign politics. This isn't the partisanship or the hackery. This is where the rubber meets the road in governance, and that's a big difference. Because your member of Congress, the person you voted for for president, whoever, they may have a big audacious goal, but without dramatic reform to the system as is, there's probably not as much of a chance for that big audacious goal to be pursued. But don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. We right-size our asks. We make sure we continue to show up time and time again for those elected officials and demonstrate through storytelling and other tools that I can teach you how to move the needle. And it's hard. I'm not going to lie. I talk about things like the federal budget, the congressional calendar, and rules for a reason. They're big barriers that we don't think about day to day when we're talking about the issues we care about most. But we should think about them from time to time because they're going to help us set our own priorities. And they're going to help us make sure we navigate through the process the right way. I'm on a mission to train one million Americans to think differently about politics, to fight more effectively for the causes they believe in, and to make real change along the way. You don't get to that without understanding some of these basic principles that are really, really driving what you can and cannot do in American politics. And if that, if that mission intrigues you, if you want to be one of those million people Hit follow right now because I want to bring you along. I want to answer the questions that you have. I want to maybe pose some questions to you along the way that get you thinking differently. And I want to find ways to equip you so that when there's something you care about, when there's an issue you care about and there's a moment to act, you're more equipped to do it just a little bit better because I fundamentally believe, and this may be crazy, 
But I fundamentally believe that if we equip citizen advocates to do it just a little bit better, do the work of advocacy just a little bit better, we're going to force everyone else in the system to have to step up their game as well. That can only be good for our system if we all have to get better at this thing called public dialogue. And I want you to be there. I want you to be there when I hit a million. I want you to be there when you need it. Because we all do from time to time. We all have some point in our lives where we bump up against bad policy, whether we think about it or not. We bump up to real challenges that can be fixed, and you can help be a part of that. That's why I blog. That's why I share content like this. That's why you're going to see more long-form videos like this from me in the coming weeks and months. Because I want to share with you right here what I share with advocates in the room who are training to do it just a little bit better. So send me your questions. Drop them in the comments section. Send me a DM, whatever. Hunt me down on my website, partofthepossible.com, and sign up for my newsletter list. Uh, you can email me there as well. I want you to be there because I want, even if I disagree with your cause, I want you to be better equipped to advocate for your cause because we deserve a better system and we're only going to get there if we own the process of making it better ourselves.